by recognizing Jerusalem and moving our embassy there, uh, our country is saying what we know from history and the Bible, that Jerusalem has actually been the capital of Jerusalem for 3,000, or capital of Israel, of Israel for 3,000 years. And here's why that is so significant. That historical truth that Jerusalem has been the capital for 3,000 years absolutely explodes the myth that comes from the left that somehow the Jewish people just came into that land 70 years ago and they took it away from the Palestinians and that the Jews have no rightful claim to it. The Bible says and history confirms that God gave that land to the Jewish people and I believe as Genesis 12 says, God blesses those countries that bless Israel and he curses those countries countries that curse Israel. I believe President Trump and the United States are not only on the right side of history in this decision, they're on the right side of God. And here it is, the Balfour Declaration. What do you feel when you, when you see it here? I genuinely feel it's one of the most extraordinary moments in the history of the Jewish people. If you think it took 3,000 years uh, to get to this, and then you say, how did this miracle happen? It's the most incredible piece of opportunism. I mean, if you think you had an impoverished uh, would-be scientist, Heim Weizmann, who somehow gets to England, meets a few people, including members of my family, seduces them, he has such great charm and conviction. He gets to Balfour, and he unbelievably persuades Balfour and Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, and most of the ministers, that this idea of um, the national home for um, Jews should be allowed to take place. I mean, it's so, so unlikely. You come back to the big point, which is that this is perhaps the greatest event in Jewish life for thousands of years. And um, it's a miracle that it took place. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. And today, once again, as you already saw in the title, of course, by the grace of God, with collaboration with Tom Fress from the United States of America, we too are gathered here together to do the 74th discussion on the subject of Jesus Christ having fulfilled Daniel's 70-week prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, especially verses 24 through 27, completely and perfectly about 2,000 years ago. He stopped all the sacrifices and oblations to cease. There is no more sacrifice for sins. This is one of the very important parts that we can also read in the book of Hebrews. That's why Tom and I uh, made the deal, let's say, <laughs> that we are going to study the book of Hebrews in the future, and I'm very much looking forward to that. But before we do that, we still have to finish this wonderful book Steve Wahlberg wrote some years ago, Exploding the Israel Deception. And we have actually just started. I think we are just in chapter 5 or chapter 6. It's not so far in the book with 13 chapters. And we have a lot and lot of study to do. Also, I can tell you that within the next few pages, we are going to busy ourselves with a deep study of the... Uh, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, 22, and 23, because that's mentioned here in the book by Steve Wahlberg, and that's why we're going to go into it deeply, because Tom and I want to make these studies, this playlist that you're watching, all the videos in there, we really want to make it that important to you as it is to us. And we can only do that by measuring everything against the Bible, leaving our church glasses and your church glasses at home and see what the Bible really has to say, not only about Daniel 70th week, which is of course the main part, which is the carrying part of it all, but what the Bible has to say about 
Jesus Christ and what it has to say about the Antichrist, because those are the two pillars of Protestantism. Jesus is the Christ, and the papacy is the Antichrist. And now here's Tom Fress. Yes, hello, Yerk, and hello to the listeners of my blessing and privilege and pleasure to be here and to continue our reading and discussion of this book. Um, a gold mine of information, life-changing information, spiritually edifying, truth-telling, and it makes sense. It makes common sense. It makes biblical sense, scriptural sense, prophetic sense. It makes every kind of sense. And it's so believable as to be ridiculous to deny it. That's the wonderful kind of truth that I've always hoped to gain from the scriptures. Instead of the book being such mystified as it is in the churches, so hard to understand and so difficult to believe that you just have to, you just have to believe what the pastor tells you instead of what the plain text of the scripture says. And all that does is elevate the pastor to some, the level of some kind of mystic, a kind of a deified status, uh, more like a Roman Catholic priest than a pastor. I would just as soon accept the plain English text of the scripture and the plain English understanding, because God can speak perfect English and he makes really good sense, and he doesn't deceive. And uh, it's so understandable, so believable, as to be, as to make what is taught in the churches laughable. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. And I'm, as I said, very much looking forward into our 74th part of the study that is going to start right now. Exploding the Israel Deception by Steve Wahlberg. We are on page 46 of 128, the 70th week of Daniel delusion. And we are talking about the following 10 points of which we have come now to point nine, which is the next one that we are going to discuss that provide logical and convincing evidence that the one week spoken of in Daniel 9.27 does not apply to any future seven-year period or tribulation of tribulation at all. And as we manifested last broadcast, a covenant is always in combination with God and not with the Antichrist all through the Bible. And we showed that last week. So in point nine, the author, Steve Wahlberg, says, for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. This is a quote, of course, from Daniel chapter nine. Now, Jesus plainly applied this abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, as we can read in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, to the time when his followers were to flee from Jerusalem before the destruction of the second temple in AD 70. Jesus told his 12 disciples, quote, when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, the Roman armies led by Prince Titus, between brackets, then know that its desolation is near. We can read that in Luke 21, verse 20. And here you can see the original 1611 King James Bible text. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Those disciples did see those very events. Christ's very last words to the Pharisees from inside the second temple were, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. As we can read in Matthew 23, 38. You are starting to get the idea why, among others, Matthew 23 is so important that we are going to do a deep study on that. Thus, Daniel's prophecy, the author continues, about Jerusalem becoming desolate, was exactly fulfilled in AD 70. Jesus understood this perfectly. And now I think I can lean back for half an hour because I know that Tom has prepared in his mind a very extensive comment about this. <laughs> well, brevity is not one of my virtues, as all my listeners can attest. But look, here we have Messiah the Prince, the Prince that shall come, using the very words of Daniel's prophecy, 
talking about the desolation of the temple. Jesus, Daniel was given from the 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 the, uh, the angel Gabriel that it that it would be desolate even unto the consummation. Okay. He talks in Daniel about the desolation of the temple and Jerusalem. The very words the prophet used. And here again, Jesus is confirming, I am the 70th week of Daniel. I am Messiah the Prince. I am the Prince that shall come. I am God who makes covenant with his people. A covenant in my own blood I make with my people, the Jews, and Jerusalem. A covenant in my own blood that makes an end of sin, that makes reconciliation for iniquity, that brings in everlasting righteousness. Okay? What part of that is yet to be done in the future? I ask the listeners emphatically, tell me what part of that is yet to be done in the future? Has he not dealt with the sin issue once and for all? Are you not washed in the precious blood of the Lamb? Do you not claim salvation in his blood, eternal life in his blood, in an eternal kingdom where righteousness rules and reigns? Are you not claiming to be joint heirs with Christ in this in this in this kingdom? Does the scripture not say that it was added to the, the kingdom daily? What do you wait for in the future? Are you a futurist or a historicist? I think the answer is clear. Our pastors have been lying to us all of our lives. Not just little white lies, damnable lies, lies that make all the difference. A lie that says the 70th week of Daniel was not fulfilled in history by Messiah the Prince, Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago, but that the 70th week of Daniel is fulfilled in the future. And not by Messiah the Prince, but by the Antichrist. Now, you can't get more jacked up than that. Okay? I've cleaned up my language. You cannot get more deceived and more jacked up than that. Now, you see what I said before? It makes sense. It makes common sense. It makes scriptural sense. It makes prophetic sense. It makes biblical sense. It makes every kind of sense. The truth just has a special ring to it that you would be a fool to deny. Now, how is it that we can continue to believe that the 70th week of Daniel is yet future? When common sense, when scriptural sense, biblical sense, prophetic sense, every kind of sense makes sense that the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled by Messiah the Prince 2,000 years ago. And there is no future fulfillment unless it's a satanic counterfeit. And you must know that if Satan is going to produce a satanic counterfeit, it will be for the purpose of presenting to God's people a false Messiah. And we've been telling you all along who that is. It's the Antichrist who was revealed 1,500 years ago, only a few hundred years after Paul wrote to the Thessalonians telling them specifically who it was, that it would be revealed in the world shortly after the Caesars were taken out of the way. And I'm preaching this to people as though they've never heard it before. Why? Because they've never heard it before. Why? Because their pastors don't preach it this way anymore. Why? Because they believe in futurism. But every Christian prior 
to the time when futurism began to be taught in the churches and the seminaries, that is, every Christian that ever drew a breath between about 1805 all the way back to the Thessalonians to whom Paul preached, they all believed that Jesus fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel. That's what made him Messiah the Prince. That's what made him the Prince that shall come. So there's no, they wouldn't even have dreamed of a future fulfillment of it, that any talk of such thing would have been laughed at. And so they were looking for the imminent revealing of the Antichrist, and they found him just as soon as the Caesars were taken out of the way. And that's the same Antichrist, the same little horn, the same man of sin, the same son of perdition that has always and forever claimed himself to be the vicar of Christ, that is, the replacement of the Son of God on earth. That's who is intended to become the false Messiah at the end of this proposed future 70th week of Daniel. It was cooked up by the Vatican. It's been performed by the Vatican and all the kings of the earth who have, who have helped him perpetuate and promote this future fulfillment, even to the point of convincing the Protestants and the evangelicals who were always historicists in the past, believed that it was Jesus who fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel. Now they believe that the Antichrist is going to fulfill the 70th, 70th week of Daniel in the future. So there's the deception. It's the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. It has deceived the very elect. How do I know? Because almost nobody is a, is a historicist anymore. To say that futurism has not deceived the very elect is to say in our generation, there are no elect. Because every church teaches futurism. And every churchman today and for the last 200 years or more, 250, is a futurist in their understanding. There is no historical fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. It's as if Jesus never even set foot in Jerusalem. And not only that, but the, 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 the 70th week of Daniel is going to be fulfilled in the future by the Antichrist. Who do you suppose that's going to be? Well, listen, <clears throat> it could be anybody including Mickey Mouse. If Mickey Mouse were to stand up and sign a seven-year peace treaty, a covenant with the Jews, for the rebuilding of the temple and animal sacrifices to be resumed, and then three and a half years later cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease, you won't be able to convince anybody that Mickey Mouse is not the Antichrist. I could say Mickey Mouse is not the Antichrist and prove it with innumerable proofs, and every professing Christian in the world would want to stone me to death for deceiving God's people. <clears throat> That's just how difficult it's going to be to convince anybody. If Mickey Mouse in his big mouse ears stood up, signed a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews, allowing them to begin animal sacrifices again, and then after three and a half years caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease, you won't be able to convince anybody that's not the Antichrist. That's just how ridiculous the churches are. That's just how ridiculous Christians are. That's just how deceived the very elect are. And if that's not the truth, then there are no elect in this world. Now, common sense won't allow me to believe that there are no elect in the world today. I think there's many out there, and they know the truth. They're just afraid to tell the truth in front of a completely deluded Christian world. Well, I'm not guided by fear anymore. And I don't care if I'm the only flesh in this world that's willing to tell the truth. Futurism is a damnable lie. Straight from the throne of the papacy to destroy the Protestant Reformation, to destroy the Bible, to destroy the gray matter and the spirits of God's elect 
and it has done a magnificent job. Jesus oh, Christ said, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. That's right. That's and that's right. what you do when you do not accept that Jesus is the Christ who completely fulfilled Daniel 70th week. You that's deny right. that Jesus is the Christ. And that's when you keep that for and when you keep that for yourself, when you don't profess Jesus Christ in the world fearlessly, then he will not know you. That's right. Then you are the ones that he proph prophesied and say, oh, many will come in those days and say, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in your name? Haven't we driven out devils? Haven't we healed the sick? Haven't we done this? Haven't we done that? And he will say, ye depart from me, ye that know, uh, that, uh, that do iniquity. I have never known you. That's Do right. you want to be those? Do you want to belong to those people? I think the point's been well made. And look, it has the ring of truth. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a ring of truth that you can't silence. <clears throat> it puts the futurist delusion into ridicule, derision. Anyone who maintains from this point the futurist interpretation of, by, of Daniel's prophecy is worthy of ridicule and pity and shame. And they need to be prayed for that God grant them repentance and a sound mind. This is serious business. This is serious as you can possibly get. There are many things that we can talk about in this world. We can talk about the flat earth. We can talk about GMOs. We can talk about harp. We can talk about chemtrails. We can talk about rabbit hole after rabbit hole, but nothing makes sense to our spiritual lives. But futurism is the most damnable lie there ever was told in this world. That's a, that's what's important. All else falls in comparison to the truth of historicism. And I'm not going to waste my listeners' time. I'm not going to waste anybody's time talking about any or all of these other issues. They have no difference to make in my salvation, but futurism is a damnable lie because futurism is the denial that jesus is the christ distraction is a very is powerful yeah distraction is a very powerful weapon of the devil so exactly right and do you and know you what be this... distracted by all of these other subjects yeah well, do you know what the greatest deception for the moment is or the distraction for the moment is tom that we live in COVID. This COVID virus agenda. Nobody cares right. about futurism anymore. And they are all busy caring about their physical lives, which will end anyway. And they are too busy to keep that up instead of caring for their eternal life. Finding God, accepting Jesus Christ and preach him crucified and risen and preach him fulfilling the 70th week of Daniel 2000 years ago. I'll tell you what, they're trying to paint COVID as the mark of the beast. They're trying to paint COVID as uh, the mark of the beast. Or the vaccination of it. Or the vaccination, you know. Uh, that you, you can't be a Christian if you don't take the vaccine. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> what, what, what book, chapter, and verse is that written in the Bible? Come on. Isn't it time for us to grow up? We follow every little shiny thing that comes down the path. We're just like a bunch of raccoons. It's time to grow up and stand on our own two feet like men. The scripture is our direction. And if the Bible doesn't talk about it, what business we got talking about it?
where is it written that the COVID vaccine is the mark of the beast? How does that compare with the mark of God? Such nonsense. To be ridiculed, just like futurism. Now, look, I'm not here to offend anybody. But how do you tell the truth in a world deceived by lies? How do you tell the truth in a world deceived by lies without offending somebody? Look. It's high time. We know the truth. And quit playing with childish toys. Quit entertaining ourselves with sensationalism and get down to the written word of God. Steve Wolberg has the same attitude. Here is the written word of God. Steve Wolberg quotes Messiah the Prince. When he says he makes the temple desolate, even until the consummation. Jesus said, your house, you, the Jews, who call yourselves the successor of Moses, your house that you built for God is now your house, and it's left unto you desolate. What does that mean? Messiah has left the building. Jesus never darkened the door of that temple ever again. And Jesus was just quoting Daniel. Why? Because Jesus was Messiah the Prince, the one about whom Daniel prophesied. And he shall make it desolate even unto the consummation. And I want to tell you, I don't agree with the vast majority of pastors who say that the temple is to be remain desolate until the end of the war. No, it says to the consummation. And that has the connotation of eternity, the consummation of the age. When Christ returns is the end of the age. So whatever temple they build on Temple Mount Jerusalem, is never going to be the house of God. You can call it the Antichrist temple. God will never dwell in a temple made with hands. It says so verbatim right in the scripture. Take it to the bank. Common sense, common English, common language, and a common understanding. God no longer dwells in temples made with hands. Enough said. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you very much, Tom. That was a very necessary and appropriate teaching on the subject. And uh, in the meanwhile, as you see, I opened up Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. And the following to make the point that Paul was telling the people who the Antichrist is. He will be historical. He will be someone popping up in the very next time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already in the time of Paul work. Only he who now letteth will it until he be taken out of the way. And history today tells us who let it who let in the time, sorry, who let in the time and who replaced him. But this is going to be a study on another subject. We already touched on that during this one, but now we are going to continue reading in the book of Steve Wahlberg. Because there's a tenth point that he has to make here. Gabriel, that is the angel, said that the 70-week prophecy specifically applied to the Jewish people in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Uh, just a few hours ago, I copied the original text from the AV 1611. So that is something that Tom also says you should always have in front of you, whether you put it on your screen 
or you write it down with your own hands, that you have a paper like this always visible next to you when you go and study the Bible, that you see that this all was fulfilled by Jesus Christ 2000 years ago, and when you have that next uh, that lying to you, or on the screen, uh, that you can read it, you will make much more uh, progress in studying the Word of God with the understanding that Jesus Christ fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel completely. So, Gabriel said that the 70-week prophecy specifically applied to the Jewish people in Daniel 9.24 because he says 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. From AD 27 to AD 34, the disciples went only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And we can read that in Matthew chapter 10, verse 6, where it says, quote, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. At the end of the 70 weeks, in the year 34 or 33, that is debatable, Stephen was stoned by the Jewish Sanhedrin, as we can read in Acts chapter 7. Then the gospel began to go to the Gentiles. In Acts chapter 9, so that's just two chapters further on in the same book, Saul became Paul by, I call it, godly intervention the Apostle of the Gentiles. And Paul says so with scriptural authority in Romans chapter 11 verse 13, where he says, For I speak to you Gentiles as in much as I am the Apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. And listen closely, this is Paul speaking, not Peter, who never was in Rome. Again, another subject for another time. Then, in the following chapter, 10 of the book of Acts, God gave Peter a vision revealing that it was now time to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And we read that in Acts chapter 10, all the verses between 1 and 38, and also in Acts chapter 13, verse 46. And I think that we are quite done with our broadcast after reading and discussion, discussing these most important Bible verses that you can see here on your screen right away because I of course copied them in the book and we are going to read them now because if Steve Wahlberg mentions them here and says that these are important facts for us to understand when or where the gospel was preached then we are going to read this right now. Acts chapter 10. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine arms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa, and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodges with one Simon a tenor, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spake to Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants, and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. And on the morrow, as they went on the journey, and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the house to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry, and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance, and saw heaven opened, 
and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet, knit at, as the four corners, and let down to the earth. Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house, and stood before the gate, and called and asked whether Simon, which was a surname Peter, were lodged here, there. While Peter thought of the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent from him to, uh, from Cornelius, and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in and lodged them. And on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him, and fell down at his feet, and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up! I myself also am a man! And as he talked with him, he went in, and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an awful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Acts chapter 13 verse 46 continues and closes this little study where it says, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed, cold, waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Powerful stuff there. In my opinion, Tom, these are very correct cited verses by Steve Wolberg to make sure the point that there was a time for the gospel to go to the Jews first and to the Gentiles after that. It is absolutely clear when we read verse 24 of Daniel, 7, uh, Daniel chapter 9 next to this, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and to thy holy city to finish the transgression, that when the 70 weeks is over, it is for all of mankind to... Right. For, to um, receive from God's grace to whom he wants to give it. That, right. at least, is my understanding of it. And That's right. I the gospel was to be given, the covenant in Christ's blood was to be given to the Jews and to Jerusalem unto the end of the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. Then the gospel, the covenant in Christ's blood, Messiah the Prince was to be given to all men. That's how we know the 70th week of Daniel is over. Jesus told them ecstatically, do not go unto the way of the Gentiles. Do not enter any other city. Why? Because the 70th week of Daniel wasn't over yet. But as soon as the 70th week of Daniel was over, the gospel was given to the Gentiles. 
that's how you know the 70th week of Daniel is over. Now, what about those uh, who talk about uh, pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib? They can't even decide what is right, what is wrong, because they have three different choices. You can either be pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib if you're a futurist. Okay, confusion is built right into it. But look at the understanding you get from the scripture. The 70th week of Daniel was over. The gospel went to the Gentiles. There's, there's no question. There's no controversy. It's just plain English. A plain and simple English interpretation. Historically proven in the scripture. We don't need to consult any man or any priest or any pastor. Right in the Bible. But if you're going to talk about, uh, you know, the, in a futurist church, you talk to a futurist pastor, you got to ask the pastor, well, is it mid-trip, pre-trip, or post-trip? And the pastor goes through all the three different choices and tells you which one he is. And But you can be whatever you want. You see that kind of wishy-washiness in the scripture? Three different ways to take the truth. Three different choices to make. Uh, look, futurism is a laughing stock. Futurism is a shameful pretension. It's the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden, and a child wouldn't believe it. But the whole Christian world believes it. Don't you be one of them. Back to you, York. Thank you very much, Tom. I was, while you were giving your comment, I was thinking of another uh, little incident. Uh, we all are aware of the text, the biblical text that is called the 70 text or the Septuagint which is the Old Testament uh, in the time of a few hundred years before Jesus Christ, I think about the third or second century before Jesus Christ came to earth, um, was published in the Gentile world, uh, which was the uh, quote-unquote Old Testament in the Greek language translated uh, in that time, but we know today that that is a forgerized text. That is a text that even some Bibles today, some of the papal Bibles, I'd like to say, adhere to. Isn't that also a proof that the world wasn't ripe to deceive the message of God because only a corrupted version of the Bible went into the nations in the form of the Septuagint text? Well, that's how Satan works. That's how Satan works. Absolutely. Tried to destroy the truth before it was ever really even born in the, among the Gentile nations. And the point is, Tom, that when he and gives the people a corrupted ridiculous. text, they don't. When, when they read it, they don't have that ring that you always talk about. It yeah. doesn't have the ring of the truth in it because the text doesn't make sense because it is not inspired. As the Bible well, they, is. they even ridiculously try to assert that Jesus quoted from the Septuagint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he only could read Greek or what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll believe any load of hooey that comes down the pike until we learn, learn the truth. And the truth sets us free and makes us mature in our Christian walk and our Christian understanding. And uh, then we're not... Uh, then we're not deceived by such childishness. But look, you have to get serious about your Christian life. You have to get serious about the scriptures. You have to get serious about the truth. A superficial Christianity is never going to accomplish anything except self-deception. And there's a whole world of that. And so... Uh, you know, it's crunch time for Christians. 
become a byword of mine. It's crunch time for Christians. There's so much deception in the world that if that if you don't understand that it's crunch time, it's time to get serious. You know, crunch time is that period before a, a college exam that you know you can't procrastinate any longer. You've got to put in all-nighters until you know the material inside and out. Well, that's where we are. Christianity is in crunch time. We've got to put in some all-nighters until we know the material. Otherwise, we're going to fail the exam. Futurism is failure of the exam. That's, that's all I got to say about it. It's childishness. And the adult understanding is historicist. History. Daniel's 70th week was fulfilled completely and perfectly in history. 2,000 years ago. And if you don't believe that, you can't see that in the scriptures, then you're going to fail the exam. I'm sorry to tell you. You've already failed the exam. Back to you, York. The explosive evidence, Steve Wahlberg says, after mentioning these 10 points, is overwhelming. Point by point, the events of the 70th week have already been fulfilled in the past by our Lord Jesus Christ, not by an imaginative future Antichrist. The following eight words found in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Confirm, covenant, many, midst, sacrifice, seize, abominations, desolate, all find a perfect fulfillment in Jesus Christ and in early Christian history. One reason why the Jewish nation as a whole failed to receive its Messiah was because its leaders and scholars failed to correctly interpret the 70-week prophecy. They failed to see Jesus Christ as the Messiah who died in the midst of the 70th week. Now, I made a little comment in here that is quite interesting, as you will see. They failed, yeah, he said, to correctly interpret the 70-week prophecy. Now, why did they fail? Also because of false teaching and, even more profoundly, because of the rabbinic curse, which was quoted by Walter Feit, who is an SDA, in his video, and the source is given at the end, if this, course, if this curse is true. Now, I say here, picture curse to show here. So let's just look for the picture with the title curse. And we're going to open that right up. And we are speaking of the Talmudic curse or rabbinic curse, as you can see here. Now, the point is, if it is not true, what I came to believe, this rabbinic curse, there are still other true facts in this regard to consider. Understand that the book of Daniel is not among the books of the prophets in the Jewish Bible. Now, we are talking about that the 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. We are speaking about the Jews, right? So, when we are talking about the Jews here, then we also need to understand that these Jews have to read everything that was written in script before. And they have to understand that Daniel was a prophet who was told a prophecy by the angel Gabriel. But when the book of Daniel is not among the prophets in the Bible, will you take Daniel's word as God's word of prophecy? Probably not. The Jews had false teachers in their synagogues then, as now the quote-unquote Christians have, had, and will have to the end too. Now, when you want to go to the rabbinic curse, 
<clears throat> which is here taken from a video from Walter Feit, The Total Onslaught, Revelation of Jesus Christ, you can go to this website, Amazing Discoveries, which is a uh, Seventh-day Adventist website. But you can also go to another interesting website where they speak about the subject. And this is something that I looked up yesterday again. Uh, it's just interesting how you sometimes find things on the Internet. And um, this website tells you of the Sanhedrin. Um, that is the course that history was to take, but due to our sins, the time frame increased. The Messiah did not come after 4,000 years passed, and furthermore, the years that elapsed since then, which were to have been the Messianic era, era have elapsed. Now, this is an interesting text when you go a little bit more through it, and you can do that because uh, these comments are to be found in, my, uh, in, in the copy of my book that you will find on my archive, uh, Internet. But first we have to understand what is this taken from. This is the Sephariah. We are the people of the book. For thousands of years, our culture, our traditions and our values have been transmitted through our texts. That's not speaking of God's culture, traditions and, and words, right? And values. <laughs> From an oral tradition of handwritten scrolls to a vast corpus of printed books, each new medium democrat democratized knowledge and brought more people into the great Jewish conversation. We are the generation charged with shepherding our text from print to digital in a way that can expand their reach and impact in new and unprecedented ways. And so on and so on. Have a look at it. The texts are given to you. But what you have to understand from this comment, first and for all, is if this rabbinic, rabbinic curse is true, then of course you have an understanding why people do not know. But then the question is again, was this rabbinic curse already, because it's from the Talmudic law, page 78, section 2, line 28, that's what they state here. I didn't check that because to find that edition of the Talmudic law, that page, that section, that line is probably not easy if you're not a Seventh-day Adventist who holds all these things. That's why um, they put that on their website. Only the text, not the source, not the reference, where that is from. Um, like an original picture or a link to the Talmudic law where, where you find that. They just write that on the website, so you have to believe it. So then the question is, was the Talmudic curse uh, or that rabbinic curse, um, curse, sorry, curse already given to the people before Jesus Christ appeared, before the 490 years or the 483 years were over? Or is that later to deceive the Jews of today, not to go into the book of Daniel and understand that Jesus Christ came already a long time ago because the Bible says in another place they did not know that time of their visitation. That's a question that's never answered when this was published. But what does that rabbinic curse say? May the bones of the hands and the bones of the fingers decay and decompose of him who turns the pages of the book of Daniel to find out the time of Daniel, chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, and may his memory rot from off the face of the earth forever. Well, if you ask me, this rabbinic curse only makes sense when you include Daniel into the prophets. But when you get a Jewish Bible, whether online or you buy one, you will not find the book of Daniel in the prophets. You will find Daniel in the books of history. And that, to me, is another great deception. Where does that deception come from? Well, I'd like to say the father of deception, the father of lies, who was a murderer from the beginning. Satan, of course, because he has a lot of minions who help him doing all these things. So the point is, the Jews failed to see Jesus Christ as the Messiah because of false teaching then, and they fail to see Jesus Christ as the Messiah today because of false teaching today, because the book of Daniel is not among the prophets, and because of this rabbinic curse, whether it's true or it's not true, I don't know, and I'm not here to decide that. I leave that up to your own investigation. 
they fail to see Jesus Christ as the Messiah who died in the midst of the 70th week. The same thing is happening today. Even Steve Wahlberg says what happened 2000 years ago, 2300 years ago, happens today. Amazingly, sincere Christian scholars, scholars are now misinterpreting the very same prophecy. Well, those sincere Christian scholars, Tom has a very profound name for them. Futurists. The entire 70 year period of great tribulation theory is a grand illusion. It is, as Tom likes to say, the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. It may go down in history as the biggest evangelical misinterpretation of the 20th century, and I add not only the 20th, but from the time futurism was taught on, the beginning of the 19th century. It can be compared to a big, fat, hot air balloon. Inside, there's no substance, only air. As soon as Daniel 9.27 is understood correctly and the pin of truth is inserted, the balloon will just pop. The fact is that no text in the whole Bible teaches any, quote, seven-year period of great tribulation, unquote. If you look for it, you will end up like Ponce de Leon, who tirelessly searched for the famous fountain of youth but never found it. Now, consider Christ saying in John chapter 5, verse 43, quote, I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive, unquote. Now that, to me, York, settles the whole case right here, right now. For Jesus' words to come true, there must be a nation-state of Israel, Refound. There must be a third temple. Refound. There must be actually done sacrifices. Refound. And since 1948, we have the first, the nation state of Israel. The second, the temple is prepared. And the third, the sacrifices, is awaiting. And the one who will come in his own name, well, that's the Antichrist of history, scripture and prophecy. No guessing around. This is the papacy. What name does the papacy give itself? Vicarius Filii Dei. That means Vicar of the Son of God. And there's a Wikipedia link where you can read about the Vicar of Christ. A quote from that website. The 2012 edition of the Annuario Pontificio, Annuario means yearly and Pontifico means pontifical, okay, of the Pontifical Annual, gives, quote, Vicar of Jesus Christ, unquote, as the second official title of the Pope, the first official title being Bishop of Rome. Another quote from a very well-known um, encyclopedia, Merriam-Webster Dictionary. Another quote reads, full definition of title under section 4a, an appellation of dignity, an appellation of honor, distinction or preeminence attached to a person or family by virtue of rank, office, precedent, privilege, attainment or lands, a person holding a title, especially of nobility speaking of the understanding what the word vicar means. And from the Catholic Encyclopedia, have a look yourself, and the link is right here, from newadvent.org, which is the actual current Catholic Encyclopedia online. Please do your own research on topics like this, and keep in mind that, we, that the adversary tries to deceive you with misinformation with this information all the way down. Now the current debate and tremendous confusion over pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation or post-tribulation, as Tom already said earlier today, is really a smokescreen of the enemy which is hiding the real issue. Well, we spoke about that. The real issue is not COVID-19, the real issue is futurism. What does Steve Wahlberg say? 
what is the real issue? He says, we will find out when we study what the book of Revelation actually teaches about Israel, what the book of Revelation actually teaches about the temple, what the book of Revelation actually teaches about Babylon the Great and Armageddon. And this continues, this chapter that we are reading of the book Exploding the Israel Deception, that was chapter 5, and next time we go into chapter 6. But now, you have heard me for so long, I think that you, as much as I, long for Tom's comment. <laughs> well, I, I think uh, the listeners should be uh, convinced uh, that what they teach in the church is just clearly wrong. It's embarrassingly wrong. It's childishly wrong. And it not only is wrong, but it has an agenda. And that's the most important part of the subject. What is the agenda of the futurist delusion that they preach universally from all the pulpits of all the churches today. What is the agenda? To make the Vicar of Christ the fulfillment of the 70th and final future week of Daniel. To present to the world a false Christ, which is what the papacy has claimed of itself all along. The vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God on earth. The papacy is literally going to be beheld in this world as what he has always claimed to be. The replacement. The Pope has replaced the Son of God on earth. And you're going to have to decide whether you're going to serve him or you're going to serve Christ. And that's been the age old question all throughout the ages. Choose you this day who you will serve. Will you serve the historical Christ or the futurist Christ? That's the question. And we've given you the correct answer. And no one can gainsay it. No one can deny it. No one can argue with it. Without identifying themselves as clearly deluded. The great seal of the United States. And that great seal of the United States has on it Novus Order Seclorum, a new order for the centuries, for the ages, forever. So confident were that our founders in their idea about one generational responsibility, one to the next, that they were confident that our country, that what they were putting forth would exist for the ages. For the ages. That was the challenge they gave us. That is the responsibility that we have. And for a couple of hundred years or more, that has always been the case. We're here today because we believe that, and we believe that the public policy that we put forth, the legislation we put forth should result in public policy that makes the future better. Uh, the Earth Summit Environmental Leadership Act, as this is known, presents us with an opportunity to follow up on the important work of the Earth Summit to develop its blueprint, Agenda 21, for envir global environmental action. His Holiness gave us a message of hope, peace, and dialogue. He challenged us to engage in dialogue, to move forward for the American people. Now watch this drive. Our enemies are innovative and resourceful. And so are we. They never stop thinking about new ways to harm our country and our people. 
and neither do we. His holiness gave us a message of hope, peace, and dialogue. He challenged us to engage in dialogue, to move forward for the American people. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about. Third time I've said that. I'll probably say it three more times, see? In my line of work, you got to keep repeating things over and over and over again for the truth to sink in, to kind of catapult the propaganda. <laughs>